It's time for AgriChat, the official podcast of the Tales of the Agronaut blog and stalwart gaming community, where we talk about stuff and things, and the stuff about the things, and sometimes gaming. I'm Belgast, and let's start the show. Hey folks, it's that time again. Time for another episode of AgriChat. This is episode 331. Tonight I'm joined by Ammo. Hello. Ashgar. Hi. Grace. I would like more snow. Kodra? Hello. Tam? I would not like more snow. We have our snow. I would like any snow. I will give you our snow if it happens again. Oklahoma is not supposed to be a land of snow. I mean... But we certainly have had a lot of it this year. Seattle I mean, certainly isn't either. I wish I'd give you all the snow I saw on my trip back to Cleveland. Yeah, I wouldn't have wanted that snow. <laughs> <laughs> anyway... Um, yeah, so we've got a list of topics, some of which have been there for a while, some of which are getting added as I speak. Um, first topic, what, what is nerds? Uh, it, it is a, uh, PG rated way of saying a swear word. Okay. It, which is also <laughs> kind of accurate for if you are playing competitive solitaire, which is what it actually is. So, this is a game that apparently people, like, play in person. I had never heard of this, but I've apparently... I've never heard of competitive solitaire. Y- yeah, so the <laughs> idea is that you have your own solitaire deck, and there are a bunch of piles in the middle, and you get points for each of your cards that you put in the middle. And the middle is, like, a... You going up each suit, ace two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You also have a nerds pile, which is where you have um the like thirteen or fourteen cards, and you can only flip over the top one at any time. And once you have uh gotten through all of your cards in the nerds pile, once your nerds pile is empty, you're able to shout out nerds. And then everyone else has to stop playing. So you gain one point for each of your cards that you put into the middle, and you lose two points for each of your cards still in your nerds pile. Other than that, standard rules of solitaire apply. You only have four piles in which to start stacking up cards. Oh, that's start, true, yes. Start with a card in the beach. Yes. Um... But yes, it is competitive solitaire. You are trying... And so, like, if somebody puts the right card into the middle, suddenly everyone else might be actively trying to get their card into there, and whoever puts the card down first uh, gets the prize. Uh, And so Zactronics apparently played this a lot in their office is the story, so they made an online competitive version of this where you are speed clicking around (laughs) and distributed for free. Yes. Uh, you get a different card back for each Zactronics game that they, uh, have made. And so they are going to pretend that they're, that is their monetization model. Um, they literally say, we're going to pretend this is a monetization model. I mean, if you get people to buy Opus Magnum, then, you know, it seems to work for me. I mean, this this probably this sounds like this is just a way of them wanting to play it remotely when everybody's remote. Mm-hmm. Yes, seems that, that way. Is, yes, that is accurate. They made this for themselves and said, "Eh, we might as well make it available to the public." It's got shockingly good net code. Like, I don't know if that's just Steam has good net code or something, but most Steam games don't make it this easy to drop in and play multiplayer. I think. It's gotten better over time, but yeah, like there's there are, there are definitely still not good Steam games for multiplayer. Cough, uh, cough. This game is stressful as heck for me when I play oh, this, yes. like because I am trying to keep my eyes on so many different things uh, while the game is happening. Because like if I there are piles in the middle that if somebody else impacts, that might be the thing that unlocks the card I need to play. And frequently I'm like, 
trying to cycle through my deck as quickly as possible just to remind me myself of what options I have and keep it like locked on one thing and try and figure out who might be playing what next. And and mostly I'm not this fast at solitaire, and so I uh, I, I, I hold my own, but it, it's definitely a game that I find myself like my heart is racing by the end of a hundred point match. My hit, heart is racing at the end of every single match. <laughs> I'm not used to solitaire being this stressful. It's extremely high nice speed solitaire. The real question is. Does it play the appropriate win animation when you win? It no, does not but play that win animation. It does Man. have a comically long uh, intro. There is a yeah, hilarious intro music. Like just truly egregious. Like, it's like the, thirty the, full seconds long. How long is it? I think it's funny, but it's it's quite long. <laughs> it's very long, and it sounds like it sounds like it belongs in the final countdown. Like that type of fanfare. It would be hilarious if they like recycled it from a project that got canceled or something. I would oh, no. believe that. Mm. It feels like the most expensive part of this game. <laughs> Someone was being real extra in the office that day. But yeah, like if you log in and one of your friends in your Steam friends list is playing, you'll just get a pop up that's like, oh, I see that so and so is playing this game. Would you like to join theirs? Like I don't have to get invited or anything. The game, the game is very good at uh, online discovery, and apparently they're also doing it where you can discover public games now too. That sounds even more stressful. But yeah, nerds, very. If you wanted to play very, like I think, very stressful solitaire. It seems like that is the opposite of the purpose of solitaire in my head. Usually, yeah, yeah. Oh so what hilarious is like Kojo put this in the list is on nerds, and I don't know if that's actually the name or if it's just nerds. No, it's just nerds, nerds online. But but when I saw it, it reminded me of Ah Real Monsters. <laughs> 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 like this is not what I expected at all. No, Ah Nerds is the sound I make uh, when I'm looking at a pile of ten cards and I'm losing points this round. I mean, it's the sound you make when you. The game starts and you have four kings and you're starting. Uh, oh demo. my goodness! Yeah, yeah. This game uh, is no- the game plays to a hundred, which means that it's okay for you to lose a hand because you are gonna lose some hands just from luck or the lack thereof. Pretty much. Yep. Okay. Next on the list, I know, I don't know if it was last week or week before last, I talked a little bit about playing Dragon Age Inquisition. Um, And last night, I finished the game. I I cleared um, the DLC content, and I'm I'm done. Like, I mean, I could have attempted to 100% it, but, like, that seems like a miserable time because there's a lot of, there's a lot of, "Quote unquote quests that are mostly filler of just going out and finding a bunch of random stuff. So I, I'm not super interested in that. But I've talked before about like my fraught relationship with Dragon Age Inquisition that I have bounced so many times off of it um, for various reasons. Like I didn't leave the hinterlands. You know, I I didn't stick around long enough because like this game takes a long while before like you're really into the game." It's a Bioware sequel. It is a slow. <laughs> it, it is crawl. the sequeliest yeah. of sequels ever because <laughs> this is not. This is not only a sequel to Dragon Age Two, but this is a sequel to Dragon Age Origins. This was a thing. This was a thing that I remember when I played it because I played it like not long after it came out, and like nobody else did, so I couldn't talk with anybody about it. But it was like it's always like okay, yes, it's a slow burn to get going, but. Boy, is the payoff great. It really is. Like, so inevitably, like, we've talked about this. There's a thing with Bioware games where I ultimately hate some of the characters and, like, vehemently hate some of the characters. But this is the first Bioware game that I have ever played that I just universally love 
every single character. Like over the course of, there's some that start out in a way that I wasn't real sure about, but over the course of the game, they evolved in a way that just made me love them all. Like there are so many great characters in this game. Um, these are probably, I don't like, I mean, I'll go out on a limb. I think they may be Bioware's finest written characters. Character arcs are so great. And even like side characters, amazing. Right. Like there's a lot of side characters that you may meet in a zone and they've got an arc to them. Like they're not just a person that like you randomly talk to every so often and gives you a single quest. No, like, there's a, there's a story arc involved with them um like the 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 bumbling you know historian out in the desert that's researching dragons like there's a whole long story arc surrounded that one person like there's a spirit that you just happen across in the middle of this zone that wants you to go do some stuff and like okay like it's a it's a full story arc um like that the the game itself is massive in scope. And I legitimately wonder if this was originally supposed to be a seamless world game (laughs) because the game, the game chunks like fit together pretty neatly to where I could see this was maybe at one point intended to be a seamless world and limitations of the frostbite engine got in the way because, you know, when you saw mass effect Andromeda, they were absolutely trying to make bigger open worlds. And like the planets are each a little bit bigger than any one of these areas in Dragon Age Inquisition, but like there's a ton of areas. And I expected there maybe just to be like six, seven areas that you went to. But like every time I turned around, I was opening a brand new full zone with its own content. Um, But like, so previously I would have said Dragon Age Origin was my favorite of the games. This this is probably now my favorite Dragon Age game. And it's not that it's more like Dragon Age Origin than Dragon Age 2 was, because it's not. It's very much yeah, not Dragon isn't. Age Origin. Yeah. It's just, like, it, it gives you more of the universe than any of the other games have. And, like, yeah. it fits together a bunch of pieces neatly that have kind of just been hanging out there. I also feel like it it does more to showcase a world worth fighting for. Yes. Mm-hmm. To, the, to the point where it like, it kind of, it kind of throws shade on Ferelden. Yeah. Yeah. Most of it being like, yeah, those are some, like, that's a backwater and it kind of sucks there. And, and like you, you encounter, you know, folks from Ferelden and they are, you know, a little bit socially backward in the ways that they do things. Um, And like, really, once you leave the hinterlands, you know, the world is more (laughs) interesting. Um, And Orlay has got some problems, like some serious problems. Yeah. That's an understatement. But like, it's also a bunch of people trying to, to survive in what is essentially a world that is besieged by a civil war by the mages and the Templars and a civil war between factions within Orle and the constant threat of the Kunari and the constant threat of the Tevinter. Like it is a world in flux. And usually in these situations, it's the little people that end up getting hurt the most. And the game does a really good job of showing you that. But the, the only... Like, I love and hate one aspect of this game is that the final DLC, Trespasser, takes place after the conclusion of the main story. And it does a lot of really interesting things. And there's a lot of, like, it it basically gives you, this is what happens several years after the events of the game. But the problem with that is, is once you start Trespasser, you are forever locked out of your previous game. And it, it's really good about telling you this, but like once you enter down that rabbit hole, you're going to have to reload from a previous save if you want to go back and do anything. Like you are essentially 
in another world at that point because everything has changed. Um, but like the wrap up was really good. All the characters felt like they got a meaningful end. You yourself, it felt like you got a meaningful end. Um, the game was w way more open on choice as to what aspects of the Dragon Age world you wanted to support and what you were willing to just ignore. Um, I mean, I went down the rabbit hole of supporting the mages over the Templar, um, and that was a permanent choice, but like a lot of the other choices as to whether or not you give certain organizations the time of day are meaningful choices, but also like just optional content. Like if you hated the, the Grey Wardens from the first game, you don't have to mess with the Grey Wardens at all. In fact, you can put events in place that are bad for the Grey Wardens. <laughs> Great I mean, you, you, you say that you made the choice to support the mages over the Templars, but is that, that really a choice? Tam made the opposite yes. choice. No, no, I made the opposite choice. <laughs> oh, oh. Okay. Ash was the one who made the opposite choice. Because I'm like, I just can't. I, I can't. No, no. But, like, the thing is, is the game does a good job. Like, this, this specific iteration of the game does a better job of showing how bad the Templars have it. In Dragon Age 2, there is no reason whatsoever to ever support the Templars. Right. In Inquisition, it's a little less clear-cut. I mean, same thing is true for Dragon Age 1, so... I mean, yeah, also true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, like, the Dragon... The Templars don't have it very good either. Like, they are... I mean, they're drug addicts. Like, and, and this game delves into that more than any of the previous ones have that they're basically chained to the order because they're giving him those good, good drugs that they need to survive. I mean, mild spoilers here, but if you do end up supporting the Templars, you can also choose to uh, disband their order. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, but then you've pissed off the mages and the Templars. <laughs> no, no, no. The, t the former Templars now work for you. Ah. Uh. And most of them are pretty okay with this. The order was not exactly doing very well by the people in it. No, it wasn't. Like, there's a lot of re revelations that come out of this game that make a lot of things about the Dragon Age se setting make more sense. Um, especially some of the elements that pick up in the in the DLC. But yeah, it's it's a great game. I'm super looking forward to whatever the fourth game ends up being, because <laughs> you kind of you kind of have an idea of where we're going based on the final hours of Inquisition. So, I mean, I think we're going to see a lot of areas that we've never been to before. So, like, Navarra and Tevinter, and um, where's Josephine from? I'm drawing a blank. Uh, Antiva. It would also be interesting if we saw some of the Kun. We've been fighting the Kunari for a really long time. <clears throat> but, like, we really only know what was shown in... Uh, Dragon Age 2, which wasn't a whole hell of a lot. Okay. I mean, Stan in Dragon Age 1 made the Kunari seem like they made no sense. Mm -hmm. And then Dragon Age 2 didn't help a lot. And to be... Like, like, you make sense of some of the things, but it still had left questions. I mean, and Iron Bull still made it leave questions. <laughs> they they view the world differently. Is, is Stan the... Who is the one in the cage? That's Stan. That's Stan? Stan. Stan. Yeah. Okay. That was angry all the time. Angry, and I mostly felt like I didn't want to be helping. Yeah, yeah. Iron Bull is great. Iron Future Bull. Future Canary characters are better, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. Iron Bull is, is great. Like, like I can't complain about Iron Bull. He's a Canary that wanted a name instead of a number. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, seems pretty reasonable to me. I remember yep. there were a whole bunch of NPCs in that game that I mostly put up with and then one I loved. I I really feel like, Kodra, that you might do okay with Inquisition. It is possible. Because I think all of the elements that made me keep bouncing off of it are elements you might like. I understand this is also true of, like, Dragon Age 2, but... Dragon Age 2 is... Dragon Age 2 is a good story, but it is a very, like, focused story. It all takes place basically in Kirkwall. 
So it's got way more political mo- maneuvering than Dragon Age Origins did. But also Inquisition has one entire character, actually two entire characters that are all about political machinations. I feel like we might be repeating a conversation, but Tam always talks about how he wants to live in a world that he understands why he is fighting for. And that is fundamentally my problem with Dragon Age 1. I don't know why I'm fighting for this world. This world seems like it sucks a lot. Yeah, you get to see, like, the nice parts of the Dragon Age world. Nicer, anyway. Yeah, I mean, like, it's it's nicer than anything that was in Ferelden. I mean, like, you get to roam around cool old elven ruins, and you go to Orle itself, which is, I mean, a very small town. <laughs> like, like, I... I would have expected this to be larger, to be like the jewel of the Empire. Meh. I feel like they might not be showing you all of the city in that case. Probably not, but... But like, the, there are, I guess it's got its kind of own regional map. Like the areas you can walk around are not very large, but... Right, right. And you do get to go to some other areas that are like palaces in Orle, but like... Palaces, that weird mission that takes place on the docks or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Poor, poor minister who thinks he should challenge you to a duel. <laughs> don't you know who I am? No, I don't. That was like, that was hilarious. Vivian had the right idea. Anyway, great game. I I look forward to, to more. I'm just kind of bummed that a lot of the people that worked on Dragon Age Inquisition are no longer at Bioware. Alas. Okay, Hyrule Warriors, Age of Calamity. Okay. Uh, go. This- this is another Warriors game that came out in November last year and purports yeah. to be a prequel to Breath of Calamity, or Breath of the Wild. It is, well, so first, first of all, it's definitely the highest quality, highest production value Warriors game they've made so far. There's a wide variety of available characters. They'll play pretty differently. And each character has some abilities tied to the Shikia Slate, like basically the same ones from Breath of the Wild, except the character used them differently. Like, everyone's got a bomb rune, but... Zelda is a, basically a mechanical genius, so she has this walking bomb dispenser that she puts out for her bomb rune, and Rivali shoots it like with his bow like an arrow, and so on and so forth. But one of the things that I find interesting about this game is that it's a prequel to Breath of the Wild, so, you know, the calamity happens and bad things happen. Except, thanks to time travel, maybe bad things don't happen. It's sort of taking the story that you have sort of seen the history from, from Breath of, from Breath of the Wild, and saying, what if it didn't happen that way? What if the plan to use the Divine Beast to contain Ganon actually worked, maybe? In this case, by pulling in some of the characters from Breath of the Wild, like Sidon and the champions from the future timeline, to help the champions from the current timeline to keep them from getting taken over in the Divine Beasts. It does kind of make me wonder if they're going to go in a different direction with the sequel to the Breath of the Wild. I doubt it. I kind of hope so, but I doubt it. Like, what if it connects up to this timeline? That would be hilarious. They could use a lot more characters if that happened. You know what I've always said that the Zelda franchise needs? More timelines. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say more side scrollers. <laughs> <laughs> they don't consider the original Hyrule Warriors as canon either, so I don't consider And they're probably not going to consider this as canon. Probably. Brian David Gilbert sure does. Yeah, but he also considers Tingle's Rosy Ruby Land as canon, so you don't need to listen to that. Can it be canon? Tingle's amazing. There are several there are several Tingle uh games. Mm-hmm. Standalone Tingle games. One is Tingle's uh Rosy Ruby Land. And what's what's the other one? Ripen Tingle's Balloon Trip of Love? Yes. Yeah. That one never came out in English. <laughs> But yeah, as far as Warriors games go, this one stands up really well. Um, it lets you command characters you aren't controlling to various places on the battlefield, helping the strategic layer a lot. So you don't need to be everywhere. You can just tell somebody else to go do a thing, and they'll at least try to do the thing, but then you can switch to them and help them do the thing later if you want to. When they are incompetent at doing the thing? I mean, the AI-controlled, the AI-controlled characters are okay, but they're not great. So like, you can tell them to go defend an outpost, they will probably keep it from getting too bad, but they probably won't be able to kill everything in the outpost. This is a significant step up from the original Hyrule Warriors, where they would just stand around doing nothing. 
In addition, the changes they made to the weak point gauge in this game. So basically you have abilities that can expose your enemy's weak points. And then if you hit their weak points, they will enough, they'll stagger and you can land a giant finishing blow on them. In the first Hyrule Warriors, this was basically the only way to do any damage at all. In this one, it is a way to do a lot of damage, but not the only way to do damage. So later, when you're stronger, it makes battles against large monsters and enemy characters a lot less of a slog. But yeah, I wrapped up this game this past week, really liked it. I would encourage if you like Warriors games or the storyline of Breath of the Wild, such as it is, to check this out. I am looking forward to trying this at some point. I feel like this one handles well enough that it could be even a good introduction to Warriors games. It's a lot less punitive than Fire Emblem Warriors was. I used to play a lot of Warriors games back in the day on, on I think, the PlayStation. I tried going back a bit, and that's uh, hard to do. Well, I mean, this was when the play- original PlayStation was relevant. Yeah, but I mean, like, I have Warriors Orochi on the PS4, and even that's a little hard to go back to from the Hyrule Warriors games and Fire Emblem Warriors. Their recent work has just been so much higher quality than the old stuff. So I'm really looking forward to Persona 5 Strikers. Yes. <laughs> Even though that's only sort of a Warriors game. It's like a Persona game with a battle system out of the Warriors games. Weird stuff. So this next topic, I believe, is a Thalen topic. Yes. So, so recently on Twitter, the information went around, surprising many people, that the cartoon Inspector Gadget originated as a Lupin the Third sequel. This is not what? entirely accurate. What happened is Deke, the company in France, started out, we're going to make Lupin the Eighth, which was Lupin but in space. But then, because Arsène Lupin is, was not at that time in uh, the public realm, uh, the controllers of Arsène Lupin got litigious and that all fell apart. So they needed a new cartoon and thus ultimately came up with Inspector Gadget. But anyway, in looking in running into this and then looking into this, I came across a video series on YouTube that has been going since 2017 that is a guy doing a mostly chronological history of Nickelodeon. Uh, at this point, he's up to the shows that debuted in 1987. So, like, I think the, the most recent one they did a video on was Finders Keepers. And so, like, this this is entirely in my wheelhouse. Like, I, I grew up during the golden age of Nickelodeon, which is the 80s. And if you believe elsewise, you are wrong. <laughs> and in fact, no. Full agreement. <laughs> the, the golden age of Nickelodeon is whenever you are the target audience for Nickelodeon. And that's something that he goes into quite a bit in the introduction video to this whole thing is that that's what actually led him to start making this series is he came across a video on YouTube by a guy complaining about how the cartoons on Nickelodeon now are nothing on the cartoons from back in the golden age of Nickelodeon. And then when he went and actually looked, what the person was referring to as the golden age was like 2012. <laughs> and it made him feel incredibly old, but then it got him started thinking about nostalgia and like, that and and about trying to look at things from a historical perspective without getting too nostalgic about them. And so in part, I wanted to, to talk about this because I feel like I should evangelize this video series because it's really good and this guy needs more, more views. It's called Nick Max. The YouTube channel is Pop Arena. Uh, if, if, if you're interested in like anywhere from 20 minute to hour and a half videos about like in-depth history about the making and impact of various Nickelodeon shows. Like it's, it's great. He does a really good job, but also like, I'm pretty sure sh- I suspect everybody else here watched Nickelodeon at least a little bit as a kid. And I know we vary very greatly in age range. So we have, you know, different opinions on what the best Nickelodeon shows were. <laughs> like, I think it was Mr. Wizard's world. Uh, you know, I was oh, gonna man. say, I'm pretty sure for me it was guts. I was also gonna say guts. <laughs> yeah, like I mean, for me, the golden age of Nickelodeon was the asset flip era of Nickelodeon, mm-hmm. where they were just co-opting shows from other countries. Yeah, because basically, <laughs> like for the the first almost decade of Nickelodeon, like up till the mid, maybe a little under a decade, but up till the mid '80s, like 
Nickelodeon was entirely, it started out as basically entirely clip shows. Like they would, they would get shorts and things from wherever and then repackage them or like in t shows brought in from Canada or Britain or what have you. And that, I mean, that's how we got, you can't do that on television from Canada. We got danger mouse from, from Britain, the tomorrow people, uh, also from Britain, things like that. And it wasn't until like double dare that they really, that Nickel a, that Nickelodeon really started be, being successful and B that they really got heavy into making their own stuff. But yeah, I just, I don't know. It's gotten me thinking about, about nostalgia and about like how I, I can entirely get that pinwheel wasn't actually all that good a show. Like it was kind of a cheap alternative to Sesame street, but also watching someone go in depth into like the history of pinwheel and how it was made and everything like made me really emotional because that was a big part of my childhood. And yeah. Yeah. And Phelan and I were talking about this before the show, but like I came at it in a weird way because I didn't have cable until I was in college. But if I had access to cable at any point, I was either watching Nickelodeon or I was watching MTV. Mm -hmm. Like, and I was trying to consume as much of either as I could possibly because I didn't have access to it at home. Yeah. And see, I wasn't allowed to watch MTV. So it was basically just Nickelodeon. Like up until the Disney afternoon came along, my television watching was entirely Saturday morning cartoons and otherwise Nickelodeon. I feel like for me, this would be if somebody did the same thing, but for Cartoon Network, which I definitely yeah, yeah. watched in the pre-Space Ghost era all the way up through, like, probably stopped really watching it in, like, 2010. Yeah. Yeah, because Cartoon Network was it was a similar thing. It started out as just re-airing old cartoons, and and then they had the idea of, like, doing something new and weird. Yeah, whereas I really didn't start watching Cartoon Network until Adult Swim existed. Mm-hmm. I mean, Cartoon yeah. Network was not my introduction to anime, but it was my introduction to non-Sailor Moon anime. I was going to say, it was basically my introduction to anime if you don't count Sailor Moon. I never had, uh, I never had access to Cartoon Network growing up, so for me it was Saturday morning cartoons on the Sci-Fi channel was anime. Oh yeah. The, um... I didn't even know that Cartoon or Sci-Fi channel had... Saturday morning cartoons. Yep. Saturday mm -hmm. morning anime on they the had, Yeah, they had they had an anime block. Um yep. like they they re they re aired Robot Carnival on it a whole whole lot. Yeah. Um, but yeah, other other stuff too. Yeah. But yeah. It's funny what you're nostalgic for too, because like yeah. I've been trying to reclaim all of these classic cartoons that I grew up with, and they were all cartoons that were like either in syndication or on one of the network channels. Uh -huh. So like I went out and found like the real Ghostbusters run and um I recently got Pirates of Dark Water. Mm -hmm. It how so does good. Pirates of Dark Water hold up? Uh, not as well as I would have hoped. <laughs> <laughs> it was the most amazing thing ever when it was new. It was the most amazing thing ever when it was new. It was basically like D and D in cartoon form after D and D in cartoon form flop. Mm -hmm. The one that does not hold up at all is Brave Star. <laughs> I tried to go watch Brave Star. It is it is a horrible it's, cartoon. It's rough. Uh, I had I had a similar experience trying to watch old episodes of Thundercats. No, that's snarf snarf. That's rough going. <laughs> the, the thing that, that makes me like physically upset is there was a really great reboot of Thundercats. Yeah. Why didn't they just make more of it? Yeah. I remember watching. Probably didn't sell enough toys. I remember watching Rocco's Modern Life episodes 
and they hold up a lot better than I would have expected. And also, I can't believe they that really I wasn't allowed as a to kid. watch those. Oh yeah, I wasn't Rock, allowed no, to watch Rocco's those. Rocco's Modern Life was like so subversive. <laughs> well, okay, it was like, remember the original Rin and Stimpy was on Nickelodeon. Yeah, I wasn't yeah, allowed to yeah, watch yeah, Rin and also, Stimpy either. Yeah, not my, after yeah. hours. Yeah, my, on... my my parents would not let me watch Rin and Stimpy. The, the thing are that I kidding? find entertaining is some of these things are things that I watched with my dad and and trying to reclaim some of them now <laughs> my dad remembers them fondly too <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah no my my uh my mom especially would just like sit and read while we were while i watched rocco's modern life and she was like yeah it's a perfectly reasonable cartoon it's got good lessons don't get a job at a sex chat line <laughs> <laughs> That's what, that was I, Rocco's job. Yeah, no, That's I know. That's what he did. He worked at the video store. He worked at a video store and also at a sex chat line. And that was a cartoon I watched as a child. Like, they were real subtle about it. But if you go back and watch, it's kind of obvious. Also, um, related, the creator of Rocco's Modern Life has a cartoon on PBS now that my kid really loves called Let's Go Luna. And it's... Like it's the exact same art style. It's it like I keep expecting Rocco Uncle or Heifer Rocco or a big up. head to sh- to like show up in the background of a scene. It's funny you're talking about your introduction to anime. I would say probably my introduction to anime was not actually anime. I mean, so I loved Robotech and various yeah. other flips, but I'm <laughs> not like I'm not saying like oh well that was the thing that led me to anime because it didn't really. Yeah, because that was kind of rare. But Ion Flux actually was probably the thing that made me want to explore more anime. Oh and, man! And people will fight you as to whether or not that was actually anime. Yeah, I mean, it was at least very anime styled. Which, yeah, like, look, man, now I want a history of Liquid Television. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. Liquid Television was amazing. Oh man, I, now I am remembering I also watched this show called Ronin Warriors and I had forgotten about it until now. Oh man. I don't remember how I watched this show. I Ronin Warriors. It, it was like watching uh, a cartoon version without robots of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, yep. which I was super into. So the weirdest time in cartoons, I think... Was you probably watched it on Cartoon Network? So I had it for a I while. Think that's, I, I think that was probably where it was at. Yeah. Um, the weirdest time for cartoons, though, was the post Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles make everything Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles era. Yes. When you when you had when you had like Street Sharks and Biker Mice from Mars and yeah Samurai Pizza Cats and Hey Samurai Pizza Cats isn't that one actually from Japan or something? It Samurai Pizza Cats is one of those shows that it is from Japan, but when they brought it over, they they didn't localize it. They just completely replaced the audio wholesale. Got it. With completely different stories, and made it very like tongue in cheek parody it's like um takeshi's castle when they they brought it over and turned it into the mxc yeah it's the exact same deal they like saban i think was responsible just like all of the power rangers like shows that came out at the same time uh uh-huh. beetleborgs like, yep yep and and like they just were like okay we're gonna hit the market with as many different versions of this as we can for full saturation yeah I'm trying to think if there was anything like really earlier that I watched like a lot, but I'm pretty sure my introduction to anime was Ranma One Half. My friend got the the Ranma One Half fighting game for Super Nintendo, and we played lots and lots and lots and lots of that because you could be a panda and beat up a guy that like shot all sorts of things out of his sleeves. I was way more into things like Ultraman during the Super Nintendo era because like one channel played it late at night the Australian version of Ultraman that I think the Super Nintendo game was based on. Okay, now we enter into the topics that have been on the list for a really, really long time section. Months. Some of which are (laughs) just random thoughts, like this one. (laughs) Is it time for Final Fantasy XIV 
and World of Warcraft to turn into free to play games. And I I don't know if I have an answer to this. So it's kind of hilarious that these are coming up now after both of these games that went through their various things in the past year. What sort of things do you mean by that? Well, I had a brand new expansion this past year. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. It was not good. No, oh, not good. On the other hand, uh, FF14 finished up their Shadowbringer storyline. Yep. It was very good. It was very, very good. But, like, I think what prompted this initially is the frustration that you can't ever go back to free-to-play in Final Fantasy XIV if you've ever had a pay- paid account. But if you don't have a paid account, you can just continue playing the next or the previous expansion every time a new expansion comes out, effectively being free to play. You're two expansions Maybe. behind, can't send tells, can't use the market board, but you can keep playing the game if you want. Right, exactly. Like, And I feel like that's a perfectly reasonable trade-off. But you can never lapse your account? R- well, so if you've, if you've ever paid for it, you just become an unpaid account. Like you can't go back to the 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 salad days of playing for free. Once you have actually bought the game in any respect, you can no longer like you can't you can't have a free account anymore. Okay. Yeah. I mean, in, in that situation, I guess if I really wanted to play Final Fantasy fourteen and really couldn't pay for it for some reason, I'd just start another account and do the free content. I don't know. So here's here's the argument i think is that you can look at these games that have gone free to play and say they actually seem to do pretty well after they went free to play they really have like i mean games make a lot of money yes free to play and no because whales spend a lot of money like okay yes there is that but like i do not think going free to play improved the old republic no mm-hmm. it didn't not at all. No. In fact, that game stagnated in free to play. Like they've not really done much of anything with it for a really long time. There's a there's a new content onslaught, but I don't know like it doesn't appear to be as fleshed out as like the Revan content was. I mean it got better eventually, but the initial transition to free to play was terrible. It was, well, like, just intensely frustrating. Even for people who were paying, it was not good. It had a lot of moments of, oh, that thing I could do that just makes sense that totally shouldn't cost money, I now can't do anymore. I mean, Riff? On the other side of that coin is fine. ESO. ESO has been a great free-to-play implementation. Like, realistically, ESA, ESO does two things that I love about their implementation. One, they gave me a reason to stay subscribed. That crafting bag is amazing. Two, <laughs> it's it's like an all-you-can-eat buffet pass if you're, if you're subscribing. Like, you don't ever have to buy any content. You just subscribe. Or if you want to buy piecemeal content, you can just buy the piecemeal content. Just buy the content that you want to play. And I, I really appreciate that. If I'm going to play ESO, I always subscribe. That's my prerogative. But if you just want to buy expansions as they come out, awesome. Just buy expansions as they come out. So I, I mean, don't know. It, I don't. I do not trust Square to do a good job of making FF14 free to play. First of all, yeah. so there is that. Yeah, I mean that's kind of that's kind of my my thought is like I was like who do I who who would I trust to do that? And the answer is nobody. <laughs> like I've seen. I think I prefer the buy to play model because mm-hmm. um, then I don't feel I don't feel like the game is from the get go trying to trying to get you to pay more money for something. Yeah, trying to get me to pay money. And really, that's more like what ESO is, I guess. You do still need to buy the box. Yeah, buy the box. I think I'm I'm fine with. That's also the Guild Wars model. Yes, also mm-hmm. the Guild Wars model. Guild Wars is weird because that's always been their model. Yeah. Yep. So, like, what is the downside of, like, what is the upside, the downside of subscription? Like, I guess it's a more reliable money stream. Yeah, I mean. It's a more predictable money stream, at least. It's more predictable. It's more predictable. It lets you use 
I don't know, more established mechanisms to do like business projections, I would say. Um, it does a certain amount of this is the way things were for a certain period of time. Yeah. So it, it does lock you into you pretty much need to release one or more months of content every month. Like you need to be operating on a you you basically need to patch every month. And like I realize that's technically not true and a bunch of places don't, but but I think they suffer for it. Like you, yeah. you have to have a, a predictable cadence. Whatever that cadence of release is, like if it's every three months, fine. But by God, you have to hit every three months. Yeah. Well, you don't have to. It's just people are going to get really frustrated with you. And the and the thing that I think creates the problem is the initial release. Because I think that once a game is rolling, the subs- like once a game is rolling and people are invested in, and into it, I feel like the the subscription isn't necessarily bad and people are like, yeah, I'll play this a couple of, you know, I'll play this at a comfortable pace. I'll pay each month as and when I feel like I'm playing enough. And that mostly works. I I think. Um, but that first three months is a killer because you get a whole bunch of people who hop in and, and it's the locust thing where, where the goal is to pay as little as possible, so by devouring as much content as possible. I'd like to point out that well, while we propose this in the context of subscription games, it is not a problem unique to them by any means. It's true. Yeah. And and I don't even know if it's pay as little as possible, because, like, I am absolutely a content locust. I don't give a shit about how much I'm paying. I just want more content. Like, if it's a thing I like... I just want more content. Like I want, I want a constant trickle of content. Um, and I think the problem is we're, we have this, this crunch cycle going on where games barely make it across the finish line and destroy morale in the process and then need a break, <laughs> like, like legitimately need a break before more content is created and they should have a break, but that's not what the player base wants or expects. Like, by the time that first month hits, they're expecting new content to be landing. I mean, and, by the and time if, the first weekend is done. Right. And, and mm-hmm. the thing is, like, this is the problem with Final Fantasy fourteen is they take a really long ass time for the point one patch. They take a really long break after they release an expansion, and well, the, they lose players because of it. They're also making very, very expensive types of content. But, like, I think in order to do it, you know, quote-unquote right, you almost need to hold back some measure of content so that you can be releasing content faster than your workforce is going to recover from the release of the game, which means you need to overbuild and I do not sure that helps. I mean, I, I that's yeah, it's a thing. It's it's a model that I don't think anybody has figured out because like, you know, when when a game like WoW came out, they could launch and then like take a bit of time to breathe while people work their way through it. Because like after the it's first a, month of WoW, when WoW it launched, took, it took you good six months to hit level cap. And yeah, wow. mm-hmm. like. Well, and, and uh, you know, I've I've made the comment a few times about WoW poisoning the well for later games, but I really believe it. I really believe that's what happened, where they they were like, well, we can keep players playing alts by speeding up the leveling process dramatically, mm-hmm. which, OK, all of our players love because they level up their alts so much faster. But now if you go into a game and it takes more than a week to get to max level, oh my god, it's so slow. It's such a slog. Right. Whereas I played for two solid years without hitting the level cap in EverQuest. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Well, and and it there wasn't it wasn't a structure that it wasn't a structure that that led a lot of people to look at it and say, if I'm not max level, I'm not really playing. Mm-hmm. Well, and that's the thing is like right now we have this structure where 
all of the content that matters is at level cap. There is no content that matters at the lower levels. Whereas stuff like Befallen at level 20, like that was fun content. Like that was that was content you look forward to doing. And that was just like the first tier of dungeons in EverQuest. Okay. But did it matter? I mean, it gave you some stuff that you're never going to replace. Yeah. <laughs> because gear mm-hmm. didn't age out the way that it does in a modern MMO. Okay. Yeah. Like, like there were things that you went back into like level 40 areas at level 60 because you needed this or that. And like, that's just where it comes from. Listen, I am familiar with trying to get a, uh, Oh my goodness, I've forgotten it. It's nature the cursed. What? Are we talking nature resistant Marodon again? No, I'm talking about getting the <laughs> uh the two percent to get a second attack trinket. Hand of justice. Oh, Hand of yeah. justice. Yeah. Yeah. And and the thing about it was in in EverQuest it wasn't like Hand of Justice was an, an a weird anomalous item that forced you to run largely irrelevant content in the hope of getting it. But like, you know, you could get a glowing black stone in EverQuest, which dropped, which dropped off of a rare spawn, like level 20 mob. Mm -hmm. And that would last you for what? 45 levels. Yeah. I mean, like you couldn't get replacements until Cabalus probably, which was level 65 content. Yeah. Like, And, and then that was like the highest of high end content. Yeah. Like, gear didn't really have levels, which meant that, like, because gear didn't have levels, if you could get it, you could use it. And because of that, like, there was well, and, gear all over the place that was good. And and gear maintained value because there wasn't bind on pickup. Bind on pickup wasn't a concept yet. Yeah. You could pass your old hand-me-downs to the guildie that's leveling up underneath you. And, like, they had nice stuff. The difference being gear was super rare to drop. Mm-hmm. Like good gear, like the rare items on the rare loot table, like really rare. Like you could farm for months and never see it. And then finally it would drop. But like if your friend was in there and it dropped and they knew you needed it, they'll just hand it to you the next time they saw you. Yeah. Like... And, there, and there was this great like progression curve too, because hardcore raiders actually made the rest of the community better because in doing so, like they're selling off their items that got them to that point because they got some new item in a zone that you can't get to, um, which, you know, ultimately made it a little easier for the next round to get to that zone. But EverQuest broke this too. Mm -hmm. They straight up broke it and they put bind on pickup and yeah, they decided like gear wasn't, wasn't unique enough, you know, to allow it to be handed out to other people. So then they even started putting in trivialization where if you are, if, if you do not get experience from a mob, it can't drop anything for you. So like the golden age of EverQuest was a very specific period through Lucklin. Well, and it was also a very specific period with a very small player base that hadn't become highly trained at, exploiting every corner of the system because like for all that we talk about you know people coming up with with super clever exploits in everquest like that pales in comparison to you know even vanilla wow era you know razor gore strats well so i think the thing that wow did that changed the gear economy the most is they introduced instancing yep because yep. in DOC and in EverQuest, you're fighting with other players for spawns. Like, the, you could not go into a unique version of your dungeon. Now, they did have some instance dungeons in the Lost Dungeons of, of Norath expansion, but, like, it worked differently. Things were tokenized, kind of. Um, so you couldn't farm quite in the same way that you could in WoW, whereas you could get a group and farm a dungeon until your eyes bleed and try for an item, which just was not a concept that existed before that. And as I understand, frequently you did? In EverQuest or in, in WoW? In EverQuest. 
Well, yeah, you, you just you sat quest. you sat around and waited on things to spawn. And like if there were two guilds in the same zone, you had to come up with a compromise like, oh, I'm only here for these mobs. Oh, I'm only here for these mobs. So you're gonna take the north half of half of the zone, and we'll take the, the south half of the zone, and we'll try really hard not to fight each other for spawns. But like the things that dropped super rare stuff were on multi week spawn timers, not multi day spawn timers. Mm-hmm. So like the scale was just different. And it was slow. Like, you know, there was no hopping into EverQuest for 30 minutes. No, because even if you were doing something that should only take a few minutes, you, know, you, 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 might, you might get hit by a bad train and die. And then you got to go get your corpse. Yeah. You can't, you can't log off and leave it there. Like, you'll just <laughs> you'll lose all your gear. Well, basically, I mean, you know, WoW changed the rules on a lot of those interactions, and it was put together by former WoW raiders that were annoyed by those constraints. Former EQ raiders, you mean? Or former EQ raiders, yeah. Yeah, well, and, mm-hmm. and because it was put together by former EQ raiders, you see that you see that endgame is the only thing that matters. Yeah. <laughs> Why not just make everything endgame? I mean, that kind of feels like the direction they're heading since they've shrunk down the content only into only 50 levels. I mean, alternatively, you... And again, like, I know I've been playing it a lot and I, I, I praise the things I play, but Guild Wars 2, everything you get, you don't know why you got it immediately, but eventually you're going to find out there was a reason you got it. Well, and and... Level cap hasn't changed in how long? Eight years. Eight years? Yeah. And there's still yeah. progression. There's still upward progression. There's still lots of things you can do. Upward progression? I mean, masteries. Still. I, I guess. Still getting you more. Like, there's. St- you're still making the bars go up and the numbers go up. You are you are you have something that you are making numbers go up on. I will agree with that. Yep. But like why I can go back and do the level 20 dungeon in this game and I might because I might need the dungeon currency for that dungeon. Yeah. Speaking because, of which. Because <laughs> I might I might need uh cat- catacombs of Ascalon Ascalon tears for a legendary and that means I have to go back and do the very first dungeon. And I probably have to run it a bunch. <laughs> oh, but you can do that on story mode, can't you? No. You can't. Oh, oh well that sucks. We have learned some things about the dungeons in this game since yeah. Oh yeah, we're forever ago. Yeah, dungeons are not nearly as scary. We've learned to play. Yeah, there. This game plays very differently than other games. We have learned how to do it. I have a tank build you might like, Bell. Okay, what class is it for? For guardian. Ah, so guardian is naturally incredibly squishy, which is kind of paradoxical, but. They are Which very is weird. Yeah, they are very, mm-hmm. very active defensey. I have a tank build that you might like as well. <laughs> is it an engineer tank? It is. Just for, it... for the record, Kodra, I have that build too, and I hope they break it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's called Strap on a Flamethrower and Melt the World. All damage you deal generates some shield, and also you're constantly generating stability stacks, which means you can't get CC'd. Something has to basically chain CC you four times in the space of a second to actually CC you. That seems real broken. A little bit. I hope they break it, but it's one of the ways to play Engineer that isn't nonsense. I When I'm in Fractals, I play one of the nonsense builds. <laughs> Listen, Engineer is by far the least played class, and it shows. It is by far the least played and least playable class? At this point, yeah, actually. <laughs> there are ways to play it that aren't insane, but... Or or broken? I mean, your choices are difficult or degenerate, basically. Yup. So I, I really hope they rework some things in this class with the expansion. So, okay, has the expansion come out or not? No. 
We don't it doesn't even much. have a date. Yeah. We have a name. And a, and a, a teaser trailer. And we have a we, name I don't believe. Yeah, we have a name we think is a lie. We, we still have half of the current season. They're not calling it season five. But we still have half of that to, to, to finish out before, before it'll be expansion time. Okay, so so has there been a expansion since the desert one? No. 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 Okay. There's been a, a the There have been two different four. living world stories seasons yeah. since then. Yeah, there's been season four and then the current one, Icebrood Saga. Okay, I guess part of me thought Icebrood Saga was a new expansion. No. You 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 could be, you know, um excused for thinking that because it has a name instead of, you know, a season number. But yeah, it's it's being released like a season. It's weird. But it is nice to be in this game and just know that anything I see will eventually matter to someone. I think Whether... it's I think it's a good thing. But that... then storage becomes a problem. <laughs> they have some clever way like so storage matters a little bit, but the they ba- they do a good job of letting you store items in non-item locations. There's, well, there's a few things. Is if it's if it's a crafting material, you've got material storage. If it's something for a collection, it's not going to drop unless you're actually unless you've actually got that collection going. And then once it's dropped, it's registered to your collection, and you can destroy or sell the physical item. And Otherwise, it's probably something that you can buy and sell on the market. So if you don't need it right now, sell it. You can always buy one later. The market doesn't shift much unless somebody decides to make a bunch of items tradable. Yeah, that that happened this past week. Yeah, or yeah. <laughs> cough, when, cough, Maguma Lamise, cough, cough. When they, when they release a patch that makes certain things drop more often and makes a lot of craftable items tradable that used to not be, then then the market shifts some. Glad I wasn't hoarding Maguma Lilies. <laughs> yeah, basically, if I make it back in, I need to probably just auction a bunch of stuff. Because probably. there's an opportunity cost at holding on to things. Yep. My rule is if if I can't shove it in material storage and I don't have an immediate use for it, use for it, I sell it. I mean, that is one thing about Guild Wars, too, is they seem to have a very healthy economy. It's certainly very active. Yeah. Well, there's not a lot of wild swings, I guess, is what I mean. It's like... No. Yeah. No, yeah. Like, a legendary still pretty much... A precursor costs pretty much what it cost when I last played. Yeah. The cost of gold might shift a bunch. Yeah, the, the, yeah. precursor costs the same amount of gold as it, as it has. But It's the, easier to get that much gold than it used to be. Yeah, In but a number also, of respects. Also, the, the, the conversion rate for gems to gold might shift under you a bit. Although it's it's mostly been pretty stable over the past few years. Like, it'll go up and down, you know, from month to month. But it, it hasn't shifted wildly in quite a while. I it thought like the, it changes more from season to season than uh, that's, I thought that's the event, like event. real world season. <laughs> events events will, will, you know, will push it up or down you know, for a little while, but it swings back to pretty close to what it was pri- prior to said event, usually. I would assume there's maybe a run on conversions if there's something for sale mm-hmm. that is really sought after, like one of the, you know, rare invitation type things that let you go someplace special. Mist locks are for sale right now. I just bought yep. mine. <laughs> yep. Mist lock is the best place to be. I feel like you can make an argument for the uh, PvP version of that, which I don't remember what it's called at the moment. It's not Obsidian Sanctuary. I mean, I feel like there might be a case for not going to Mistlock if you just want to go to some place that there's not as many people there. Also that, yeah. Yeah, there's there's usually a lot of people in Mistlock. And sometimes one of them turns into a beetle and then, like, makes the entire zone glow. Because some stuff is broken when you turn into a... Into a when you shapeshift. Uh-huh. It's kind of like how remember in, in uh, Fantasy Star Online there were like ways to make the like the Rappy heads giant and things like that. Yeah, the Rappy costume messed with the size of a lot of a lot of attachments. Yeah, like turning into a uh, into a figure or whatever can do similar things with like infusion effects. Random comment about Fantasy Star Online too. Apparently, it's starting to alpha test in Japan. 
The new thing? The new thing. The Genesis thing. I'm really interested in how that goes. Me too. I want it to very much be a success. <laughs> I mean, it's still targeting a 2021 release. Anyway, um, any other quick things? More games should make uh, their entire play experience relevant. Yes. I would agree. I think I think that is the biggest strength of Guild Wars is that its content is never stale. Unless you're one of those people who believes that uh, only rates matter. <laughs> These people do exist. Maybe they're playing the wrong game, but possibly. I mean, whatever. There are legendary weapons that need lots of things outside of raiding. And legendary they are, weapons intentionally need the entire game, basically. And they are cool as heck. Legendary armor is needs raiding. Yes. Or World World. Or World, World or PvP. I was going to say yes, but isn't legendary armor way less cool than legendary weapons? No, the raid legendary armor is almost as cool as legendary weapons. What? That seems impossible. Like, does it, act, does it like, give you different character effects as well? It transforms and glows. It's, quite frankly, really awesome looking. So we need to, we need to get five more people to play that. <laughs> I mean, I've been saying this for a while. But yeah. Raids and strikes. I would consider it, but your active hours are outside of my active hours. Yeah, I yeah. know. Okay, well... In that case, um, hopefully you all enjoyed the show, and we will see you again next week. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good Good night, night, future archive viewers. (laughs) See ya. Also wrong site. Just wait.